Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. We are on the Tens of Dollars Road Tour, and we are allowed, we're admitted, we are inside the factory. So you can hear some factory noise in the background. You're also going to hear the fan cooling my fat ass off from behind because it's Arizona. It's 108 degrees outside. We are in the home of Patriot Ordnance Factory, where some of the finest firearms are assembled, built by some of the finest people I've ever met. And guess what? We've got somebody else in the studio. We've got another willing victim. We've got Thomas Yaxall, photographer. Name sound familiar for those of you lives in Arizona, for those of you that live in Arizona, and for those of you that have the national news, you might know who Thomas is. Today, you're going to know more about Thomas than what you might already know. There's a hundred different ways I can start this, and I don't know which one's going to be right, so we're just going to go with it. Thomas, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for trusting us. Of thank course, you, Ed. Thank you for coming out. Your patience with us. 2017. Yep. January 12th. January 12th. I, I knew you'd remember that. 4.30 in the morning. People who don't live in Arizona don't know that when we have to leave the desert for anything, we like to do that early in the day to avoid any potential mechanical problems or we want to get out of the heat. Just to beat the traffic that Beat morning. the traffic. Yeah. And so you were on your way to, you're a photographer, full-time photographer. Right. Um, writer, author. Not author. I call you an author because you write articles. I have been published. Some of my articles have been published. So I guess you could say I'm a, I'm a published photojournalist. Um, I do it full time. It's how I make my living. Um, uh, I contract for the Department of Education when schools are actually in session. Um, I do a lot of work within the firearm industry. I'm fortunate. I do content for C2 Tactical. Uh, I've done content for John Correa. Um, I've done some stuff for Scott Jedlinski, um, other instructors, um, when I'm asked to, um, which actually works out really good. I've been shooting all my life. So for me, when people say, hey, good day on the range, it's doubly good because I get to do photography and, and I get to shoot. And, you, and you're, you're just proven that you're very humble. Not only do you shoot, you're a great shot. <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that I've way. sat eating a hot dog and I watched you shoot. Do you do three guns still? Do you do three no, guns? actually, I've never done three guns. I see you carrying three bags. What's in the other two bags? You got a shot, automatic shotgun. I don't know. You've got some kind of shotgun. Right. So I have my pump and my autoloader, and then I have my two rifles, and then I have my two pistols. Um, so, I mean, I, I have everything I need. Am I proficient in all platforms? Yes. Um, but I've had the privilege of learning from a lot of great instructors. So, um, being having some natural ability, but. Uh, being able to work with people and train with people who are better than me and just really being cognizant and paying attention and practicing that on a continual basis. I tell people all the time, um, just because you take one class does not make you proficient. Um, you need to spend hours upon hours and thousands upon thousands of rounds to be proficient and skilled on any platform. So we take training. He's echoing what we say. We yes. take training and then you do what you practice. Yes. And then you develop some bad habits and then you have peers who help you. And then you take another class, and then you practice, and you practice. It took over practice. 20 years. Well, I shouldn't say over 20 years. So the running joke is um, after the shooting, and then we'll call it what it was. It was a shooting. It was a use of, use of lethal force. Um, some instructors saw me shoot, and they're like, whoa, 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 you're still shooting modified Weaver. <laughs> we need to get you into the current present day. And so the ongoing joke is, is I'm, it's so ingrained in me, Lord forbid I ever have to be in a use of lethal force again, I'll revert back to modified Weaver. And even with the isosceles, when I push out, I still don't push out. I, I still kind of camp my body. But you go with what you know, and I've heard some of the best instructors say, look, I'm going to show you how I do it. Doesn't mean it's right, and you're going to take it, and you're going to use it. And if you're on target, and you're quick, and you're good, hey, God bless you. You know, that's that's what we're looking for. And that's a good instructor. Yeah. And um, the reason I train with who I train with is they are instructors who also seek instruction. They're not static in their ways. And I think that is brilliant. And I think that shows a person of good character anyways. If you are willing to constantly improve your skill set, this way you can deliver the most current um, and useful skill set to your students. So I think that's really important all around. Um, but yeah, so it was 430 in the morning. Um it, I was on my way to Anaheim, uh, Disneyland, 
And no, there was no Disneyland commercial after it. Hey, you just did that. <laughs> I'm going to Disneyland. Um, so, I mean, and it should be said, and sometimes it gets left out and everything like that. I was, I was traveling, um, with a companion, Heidi Jones, um, and she was, uh, running some marathons at Disneyland. I was actually going to go to Leica in Los Angeles because I shoot Leica rangefinders for my personal work. Um, Anybody who knows Arizona, I-10 and Miller Road, we stop there at Quick Trip, top off the tank, get some roads and acts and stuff, and uh, we get back on I-10, and no sooner do we get on I-10, we see Trooper Ed Anderson get onto I-10 from Interstate 8. And he goes bombing down the freeway, and he's gone. His lights are gone, and, you know, kind of, oh, someone's having a bad morning type thing. So we're driving, time goes by, and we see his lights in the distance, Um that stretch of road undulates anyway, so we could see him, and then he disappears. See him disappear. Well, I noticed that vehicles are moving from the number two lane to the number one lane, and then I noticed this flare pattern. So in my head, I'm thinking accident, debris, we need to slow down. So I slow down. As we get closer, I'm straddling the one lane in the left shoulder. And as we come up to the back of that plat- uh, flare pattern, we see Trooper Anderson. He had already been, at this point, we didn't realize he had been shot, but he had already been shot by the suspect. He's on his back, and the suspect is is bludgeoning him. He's he's slamming his head into the asphalt. At that point, you know, I, I look at Heidi. I tell her to call nine one one. And the twenty two, twenty three plus years of training I've had, they take control. So everything is an automated response at that point. I give myself enough distance to go to work. Um, I exit my vehicle in close ready. Um, there was some news article saying that I'd gone back to my vehicle to get my gun, which is false. Um, so I exit in the close ready. So now as I exit my vehicle, I'm in the nine o'clock position. Ed would be in the three o'clock position. And I, I sidestep to the, to the left, which would be the 10 o'clock because his headlights are blinding me. Um, and then it's just in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward at no time do I stop, but subconsciously I'm checking off the threats. There's a dead meat female. She's not a threat. Ed still had his gun holstered. So that's out of the equation. Bad guy has nothing in his hands. That's out of the equation. I see that there's a gun with a slide lock back. That's out of the equation. But the whole time I'm also thinking I need clear line of fire. I don't want Ed to be in my line of fire. So I'm, I'm coming up into the right shoulder area, drifting around to the 12 o'clock. And at that point, you know, I call out, you know, you know, trooper, do you need assistance? He gives the affirmative and I give a direct command to the suspect to stop. The suspect actually tells me to shut up. Yeah. Which, at the time, it doesn't really register, but yeah. so obviously he hears me. Obviously, he's intent on, on still doing Ed harm, but as soon as he says shut up, he lifts his hands to strike Ed again, and at that point, I just push out. Um, I fired three, four times. At the time, I thought I only fired three times, but I fire four times. I'm fortunate enough to get three hits. Um, I end the threat and then immediately go into first responder mode with Ed. Um, Heidi's just getting off the phone with 911. At some point, another uh, civilian had pulled over. Um, everything's done at this point. We're waiting for um, law enforcement to show up. Um, first trooper on the scene was uh, Sergeant uh, Bill Westick. Now, had you made the radio call, or was that the other citizen? That, that was the other citizen. Okay. So, I mean, and no offense to him, we're trying to let him know we exactly. got it under control, but he, he got a little excited, and who wouldn't exactly. under those well, circumstances? Well, I'm not faulting him at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Um, Sergeant Westick shows up, and I know in my head, I, I've trained with enough law enforcement, military, range masters, stuff like that, what's going to happen at this point. I had already made sure there's no possibility for another bad guy, so my gun is in the right shoulder. As soon as Sergeant Westick rolls up, and he rolls out of his vehicle, he's already slung, and the low ready with his AR, my hands go up, and I start giving him very accurate information. My name is Thomas. This is Trooper Anderson. He has a GSW to the right shoulder. You have dead suspect. You have a dead female approximately 50 feet behind me. Suspect's gun, my gun. Because I want to, one, offer him reassurance, and two, give him control of the scene. Because at that moment, I'm in control of the scene. That's not my responsibility anymore now that he's there. And if you're um, a responsible gun holder, you should be taking notes right now. Well, and that's because of training. So, I mean, it all falls back to that. Um, yeah, so Sergeant Westick. Um, <clears throat> so he did it amazingly well. And... At that point, I mean, you go through so many different things when you're involved in what they refer to um, as a critical dynamic incident. I mean, it's a shooting again. But I experienced the time dilation, the tunnel vision, uh, the auditory exclusion, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, But it did take uh, an extraordinary amount of time because we're at mile marker 89. We're in the middle of nowhere. Um, But, I mean, you blink and then 
everybody was there. Um, you had law enforcement from all different departments. You had first responder units from all different departments um, and areas. And I mean, it was a circus. To put it mildly, it was a circus. But I'm still at, at that point. I'm I'm still in denial. I know what happened. I, I I know what I did. But I'm really looking at my watch, going, if we can get back on the road here pretty quick, I could beat that rush hour traffic. That's that's really what's my mind's focused on. Um, and so it's just odd how how subconsciously your mind takes care of itself and in, and in turn is taking care Protect of you. you. Absolutely. Um, so there's, you know, throughout that course of the time, we're on the side of the road. They have a separated its protocol because we're technically at a homicide scene um, and they have to determine was it justifiable or not. Um, they have us in separate vehicles. Everybody was very pleasant. My concern was Heidi and Trooper Anderson. Um, they had taken me from Sergeant Westick's vehicle and put me into a first responder vehicle across the street. And that was actually at the first time that anybody had tried calling me a hero and I immediately shut him down. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, but I shut him down. But that was also the first time that I realized that God got involved. And there was that coming a full circle with my faith and how powerful a moment that was for me. Um, so I was more than happy to give everything up to the Lord and say, nope, I'm just thankful that he chose me, even though I didn't understand why at that time, um, he chose me to be his instrument that morning because a very good man got to go back home to his family. The bad guy was stopped and that's a good day for everybody. Looking back now, I think that, that all things happen for a reason. People that's why we're talking about the steps reasons. behind because yeah. these, someone once told you that they thought this was a coincidence. Folks, this is not a coincidence. These are steps that were ordered right. so that he could be at that place at 4.30 in the morning so that that good man could go home to his family. Yeah.